the the secret of, of our success was not failing. Uh, there were so many things over the years that could have gotten us that a lot of it has to be put down to luck. Um, but clearly the market thought we had good games and so far we've been able to navigate the waters of business. Hi, welcome to the Dyke Podcast. I'm Gary Snow, and joining me today is the amazing Steve Jackson, who's had a distinguished career in the game design industry. Uh, he's done GURPS, Car Wars, The Fantasy Trip, and last but not least, Munchkin, and uh, a whole countless part of other games as well. And uh, it's just been an honor to have Steve Jackson join me today. Welcome, Steve. Well, thank you. We'll try to do an amazing and distinguished podcast for everyone. <laughs> Well, you, you, you've had such a long running career and you've had so many influences. I've interviewed many designers on this podcast that have actually said how much you've influenced them. And uh, so we'll talk about your whole career in, in, in its entirety, but let's just go way back to the beginning and your start. And how did you get involved with this crazy little hobby? Well, in college, I played a whole lot of risk and a lot of the SPI games, and it was just a continuing interest. And, and then did you approach the game world? Like, did you seek out trying to design games yourself? Ah, uh, no, I just played games. And then one day when I should have been doing homework, I was reading classified ads and I saw a help wanted ad for a zine editor. Now zine was very much a code word uh, 40, 50 years ago. It meant uh, science fiction zine and that was all it meant. So I said, aha, they're looking for me. And I responded and I did not get the job. I was overqualified because it turned out to be with metagaming and they were so delighted to have somebody respond who actually played games that uh, I was contracted to do game development. And Ben Ostrander got the space gamer editing job and did fine. And so that started your relationship with metagaming, correct? Yes. And then how did, how did that start to flow through as far as like you designing games for them? What was your first product and your first initial pitch to them? My first game was Ogre. I had done game development work on uh, Godspire and uh, that, that went all right. The, uh, the pitch from Howard Thompson, the owner of Metagaming was, I have this crazy idea for little bitty games, games that will fit in a paperback book rack at the bookstore. That was the high concept. And he never got into those bookstore paperback book racks, but the micro game line had a good long run. And the first one of those was Ogre, which was designed to his physical specifications to fit into that micro game package. And I'm not too sure. I have a copy of Sunday Drivers of the glue's kind of gone on it, but it, was it this size of casing? That uh, you guys yes, it was about that size. The original micros were in plastic bags. Oh, okay, okay. Not even Ziploc bags, sandwich bags folded over and taped. Well, I, and so in that era, that's 1977, I think that Ogre came out. And when I yes. look at the, the general landscape of what was happening at that time, you got Traveler that I think came out, Star Wars uh, was in the, the zeitgeist and um, Dungeons and Dragons was starting to take hold. So when did you transition from like more of like strategy wargaming to uh, more of a um, role-playing kind of mentality well i never made a full transition my second game was melee which is a combat game designed to work with frp 
but I have always been a very general gaming nut. And when something new comes along, I want to try it. And uh, Melee, that was uh, basically um, a gladiator combat on a hex grid. And then you make yes. your, your two gladiators and you go at it, right? Yes. Two or it works very smoothly with even three or four on a side. If you try and pull in the whole squad level skirmish, it still mechanically works, but it's cumbersome to play. You want to see the other guys turn over so yours can start. And, and then you came up with the companion to uh, Melee, uh, Wizard. Yes. And so was there enough interest from the Melee uh, game that everybody was clamoring to go, hey, I got to get magic into the same kind of concept? Pretty much. And then having done those, the clamor was write a full role playing system, Steve. So I said, OK, little knowing how long it was going to take me. And what was the, uh, the, the background, like the mechanics of it from Melee Wizard? And how did that play into the role playing game part of it? And was it tough to transition from those uh, strat strategic elements into the role playing part? And like what kind of uh, leaps did you have to make? Well, there's a very distinct uh, strategy game influence in Melee. It uses only six-sided dice because I was very familiar with the bell-shaped curve of three, of three six-sided dice. I could make that little curve dance, and uh, so I did. And that bell curve, the 3D6, I mean, that's kind of been uh, your even going to GURPS, like that's kind of been something that you've been playing with throughout uh, your whole career. Yes. I look at Polyhedra for various things, but I always come back to the D6. And so when you, you did the fantasy trip and that was still under uh, metagaming, correct? Like That's that right. Way. And when, when did you say, you know what, I'm going to strike out on my own. I'm going to start up Steve Jackson games. Well, it was a gradual thing. Uh, Metagaming did not want to own the Space Gamer magazine any longer. It had become bigger and prettier and more influential and more of a time sink uh, when they wanted to be putting out games. So I bought Space Gamer and put it out on my own for a couple of issues. But... Uh, I, I said some things that annoyed Howard, and the relationship kind of degenerated. And so Space Gamer Magazine, for those that aren't familiar, uh, can you just tell us what the, the, the roots or the, the content was of that? It, w it was uh, a, an independent magazine for science fiction and fantasy gaming. And so you covered like uh, Traveler, I'm assuming. Um, yes. What else was in? What else was happening? What other games were kind of popular amongst Traveler that might have not survived? Well, you remember Empire of the Petal Throne. I don't personally, but you don't. No. Oh, Empire of the Petal Throne is a marvelous creation. Uh, some unfortunate things, uh, uh, some disgusting things have come out recently about its creator. Uh, that doesn't take away from the fact that EPT is the, I think, still the, the densest, most original background uh, ever created for an RPG. The big flaw of Empire of the Petal Throne is it's not entirely clear what the players are supposed to do. It was the second RPG published by TSR, and the game mechanics have a TSR influence that probably wouldn't have been there without TSR, duh, circular reasoning. Um, but we wrote about that. We wrote about the micro games, almost all of which were science fiction and fantasy in nature. We had an active letter column. It was a good little zine. Did, did you enjoy the publishing part of it or the writing yeah, part of it? Or the very game? much. Uh, all of it. 
and well, I remember like reading and even in some of your future magazines, uh, you know, you were quite active in the editorial and responding to letters and that kind of thing. What, how, how did the community shape out um, as you were like growing Steve Jackson games and uh, prior to the internet, like how did you, how did that community grow for you? It grew largely in local retailers. It communicated slowly pre-internet, uh, but uh, the retailers have always been where you meet new people and play games with them. And, and that may change someday if the virtual tabletop is really perfected, but it's still true now. Go support your local retailer, play a game. And this might be a good pitch for, I actually did a documentary. I don't know if you saw it, Steve, but I did a documentary on the world's largest game store, uh, which is the Century Box in Calgary, Alberta. And there's a one hour documentary. I will put the link to it up above and people are welcome to check that out. Our manager of director of sales, uh, Ross Jepson lives in Canada and Century Box is his uh, friendly local game store. So he gets in a lot of good game in there. Oh, cool. Cool. I'll have to see if he's around one day. Um, just, uh, just look ahead above everybody else. <laughs> I wonder Ross is I a tall him. man. Yeah. If you see a a smile way up there in the air, that's Ross. <laughs> that's funny. And actually, when we were doing the promo for the documentary, there was somebody that did end up taking our photo that was like a good like six foot seven because he was taller and he could take our photo from a better vantage point. So we got the customer who knows, maybe that was him. Um, could have been. You also bought a, a fire and movement magazine uh, to round out uh, the war gaming side of things. And so yes. you were you had two kind of active magazines going and in two different spaces. And then you came up with Car Wars. How did, how did, what was the initial kind of concept and uh, the idea behind Car Wars and how, how did that play out as far as designing it? Well, the idea behind Car Wars, of course, is really simple. We have a dystopic future, uh, post small Holocaust, uh, in which order has broken down and First, people arm their cars just for self-defense, and the, then they arm their cars because it's fun to shoot at other cars. One thing leads to another. And I remember seeing in the, because uh, Car Wars was my first introduction to you uh, in your game design. So I've got like the, the original uh, books, the auto doodle quarterlies. And I have to ask you, who came up with the idea for Uncle Albert uh, as far as an in-game character? Because, I mean, that was, to me, I mean, that was the most one of the most joyous things of building your car was seeing Uncle Albert's descriptions of the weapons that you could... I don't even remember whose idea Uncle Albert was. The image came from clip art, and we modified it just a little bit to make him look shiftier. And uh, we had so much fun with Uncle Albert. Well, and I just, like I said, it's one of those, the first kind of moments, and I, I, boy, I'm trying to think of how old I was at this point, maybe 11, 12 years old. And so me and my friends, we would be playing, you know, usually Dungeons and Dragons for the most part, but sometimes you'd want to switch it up and Car Wars was our go-to game. And then all those kind of annoying things that we hated about each other, we got to take it out on each other on the <laughs> arena or... <laughs> And then we get back to kind of Dungeons and Dragons gaming. But anyways, I really love the process of building the cars and I love the process of like uh, fighting and, and it's essentially like kind of like melee uh, or melee um, Canadian accent here. Uh, and then, uh, but on the arena, I'm not really sure what's preserved, what's yeah. preferred there, but uh, I, I know which game you mean and that's all that matters. Well, I, I really sure. loved Car, Car Wars, and we're going to talk about, well, maybe we should talk about it now. So you recently rebooted Car Wars uh, with a, a new yes. set and larger uh, cars compared to the cardboard miniatures that were used. Big cars. Yeah. And I know uh, I've heard lots of people say when Car Wars, the new set, is at a convention and taking up all the space 
and people go in there and they're just wowed by it because it's such a dynamic environment of like people playing and that, that's what i loved about even car wars and tournaments because it was like a nice tournament you build your car everybody's on the same playing field and then you fight it out it's kind of fair it can be really spectacular i love going to an event and seeing the material that people have built to dress up their playing surface you have badland scenes or arena scenes uh, it's great and i think i read somewhere that and you could correct me if i'm wrong and it's been a long time you might not remember but i think it sold a hundred thousand copies or something to yes that effect. yes that no. was a big milestone for us that was by far the most copies we had ever sold of a single game and so reflecting upon now in today's world a hundred thousand copies is that like where does that fit into compared to today's market is there is it more niche or how was it a limited amount of games so like they sold more it's still a big deal there were fewer games then so the big hits could sell more but a hundred thousand games now is still a massive achievement especially with all the games being kick-started every month and some of them are wonderful games that will just eat your brain. And some of them are very sad attempts that will just eat your pocketbook. And if only there were a way to tell them apart in advance. But it's definitely a golden age for the gamer now. And you, I mean, in thinking about that, I mean, a lot of my viewers are aspiring game designers. Um, and I know we were going to ask your advice on things, but maybe this is a good point to ask the question of, it is a golden age of game design, but what kind of fundamentals, like you said, some games on Kickstarter, like, I mean, I spot them from time to time, they kind of seem like a bit of a money grab, but sometimes those ones that I think are a money grab, I go, wow, they're super successful. Is it in the marketing? Is it like, what, what do you recommend people that want to get into game design? look at as far as like how should they approach it ethically morally marketing wise all those types of things well ethically and morally don't promise anything that you're not going to deliver and treat your customers well uh, because unless you are a pure cash grab you're going you you want to be around for a while and you want people to remember you well that's the selfish reason for treating people right. I, I hope you don't need a selfish reason to treat people right, but so it goes. Um, in terms of marketing, Kickstarter is a good thing. Um, if you're on Kickstarter, keep your promises, update people regularly, and have good art because... In the first place, art adds a great deal to the playing experience for some people. Others don't care as much. But even people who don't care as much will tend to focus on the art in a Kickstarter because it's all they see. They make a subconscious assumption that if the designer cared about art, they probably cared about oh, proofreading and things like that, too and play tested more than once. So make your campaign look pretty. We have a campaign plug time. We have a campaign and it's finishing hours right now for hexagram number 10, which is a zine for the fantasy trip and a standalone supplement for TFT called the Torio School which could be called Harry Potter on steroids. It's a wizard's combat school. So not everybody graduates, not everybody survives. And I've heard a few other uh, more seasoned uh, game designers say that they see that there's not enough play testing being done in some of the games. And is, is that just the nature of the, the world in general? Like you often see software put out in beta form and then they just kind of revise it and improve upon it. And with so many games being digital, that's also achievable? There's a lot of that. 
there's a terrible tendency for people to think that if their friends really like a game and have played it a lot, it's been play tested. And you have to expose it to different groups. And how, what kind of rigorous testing do you guys do at Steve Jackson Games? And then a second part of that is I have to ask how many people work for Steve Jackson Games at any given time, contractors and regular employees? Second question, first, we have about 40 between full-time contractors and regular staff. I think it's not quite 40. Uh, Playtesting depends a lot on the individual game. We play a lot in the office, of course. A number of people have their own play groups. We take games to conventions. Um, sometimes we mail or email them to people who we know will do a good job of giving us another viewpoint. It all varies. We wouldn't have to add very many people before I would want a full-time commissar of playtesting, but we're not there yet. And when you, uh, and sorry, I'm kind of jumping around, but since we're in the subject of like your company, there's been a lot of companies that have come and gone over the time that you've been making games. And now you have 40 people that are working for you in some capacity or another. And do you ever kind of go like, how do you, ever, do you know what the secret of your success was? Like over all this dying. time? Sorry, that's again? The, the secret of, of our success was not failing. Um, <laughs> There were so many things over the years that could have gotten us that a lot of it has to be put down to luck. Um, but clearly the market thought we had good games and so far we've been able to navigate the waters of business. The one incident in particular, I know uh, it's been well written up, but maybe just if you can give us a, a, a backstory on the uh, secret service raiding your uh, offices and uh, kind of that probably was a, a tough time for you as a company. That was the closest to a one hit kill that we ever suffered. Yes. The Secret Service, and this is a long story and it's documented online, so I won't go into a lot of details. The Secret Service formed the opinion that one of our employees was an evil master hacker who had uh, vital documents on his machine. And they raided our office. And one of the things they found was the manuscript for GURPS Cyberpunk, which if you are a Secret Service agent who knows nothing about computers, could I suppose be taken for a, a document about computer hacking. So they stood up in front of the media and talked about what they had found. And even after it was demonstrated that they hadn't found anything like what they wanted, it was years before we got it back. And they took every copy of that iteration of GURP Cyberpunk. We had to go back to off-site backups and recover from an earlier point. And it was a mess. We were already at that point, not in a good financial situation. It had been a hard year and that very nearly strangled the cash flow. We had to lay off half the staff. Oh. And then uh, I think, uh, I forget how long ago it was exactly. I think it was in 90. But you had a anniversary um, in 2020, I think, with the Electronic Frontier Foundation, where you reminisced, or maybe it was a little bit longer ago. But just the EFF, that was like their first big case as an organization. It, to it was one of their first big cases. Uh, the EFF was formed because Mitchell K. Poor and John Perry Barlow heard about the Steve Jackson Games case and one other and said, somebody should do something. And then they did, all respect. And so you won the case uh, and some damages uh, towards, uh, for the cost of their legal counsel, et cetera. 
and then you got to yes. then you dusted off cyberpunk uh gurps and it's kind of uh but the gurps concept itself when did when did you decide to uh unveil gurps and how long did that process take to get it to a place where you were happy as a, a role-playing game because gurps as everybody knows is like one of the foundational games within the hobby I can't even remember what year we finally got to print with it. I started working on it almost as soon as we became an independent company. And it took a long while because I was ambitious and I was also distracted. Well, you had multiple magazines, multiple games. And uh, so when did you finally find the time for GURPS? And you said, okay, I'm finally going to do it. I can't remember the year. How's that? <laughs> Good. Well, I happen to know that it was at 86 at Origin um, that you unveiled GURPS. Okay. And then from there, I I actually haven't counted how many settings were created for ne GURPS. Neither. Several. So we, we recently had uh, Lee Gold uh, on our show, and I think she did GURPS yes. Japan. And so she was a guest. I'll link to that as well. Our interview with Lee Gold um, and so many other people that got their starts, start working uh, with GURPS. And you also had the accompanying uh, role player magazine, which was basically GURPS content that you would have uh, monthly. And once again, going back into the magazine world and like letters to the editor and advice and that kind of thing. So you, you yes, really... I, I like doing zines. I like short form stuff and they have a tendency to sprawl and get big and get less fun. So they have a life cycle. And when you uh, look back upon the success of GURPS and all the supplements, um, and it's tough to say because I know Munchkin is probably maybe uh, the most popular by sales and volume, but do you look at GURPS as maybe, or maybe it's the fantasy trip as your foundational game that you're the most proud of? Well, that's kind of like asking a parent which of their children they like the best. Well, everybody has well, a favorite. Yeah, well, I don't want to my favorite though. depends on the day. It really does. And so with GURPS, like you, uh, all the supplements over the years and uh, and the growth of it, and I know like you're, uh, when you went into the nineties and I think uh, the collectible card games, the Illuminati uh, card game, did you see the trends changing and you, you saw an opportunity there? I had to have my arm twisted very hard by a couple of staff members. I thought the time had already passed for CCGs. They convinced me I was wrong and that we should put out either a Car Wars or an Illuminati game. We decided that an Illuminati game would be more different from the rest of the marketplace than a Car Wars collectible game. And we went with that. And by the way, currently undergoing a soft launch on Steam is an Illuminati game, which could just as well be called Inwo because it draws a lot from the Inwo paradigms. It's a good game. And that goes back to uh, the original Illuminati. I think that came out in 83. Um, and so you took the concept of that role-playing game and then moved it into the card game. And Well, no, Illuminati was never a role-playing game. There was a card game and then there was a collectible card game. Okay. Okay. I did not, I thought Illuminati was actually a role-playing game. So the collectible card game, it's been uh, well-documented about, there's two cards in particular. Um, and we just passed 9-11 here yesterday uh, at the time of this recording depicting, and there was two cards that eerily predicted or foreshadowed um, the World Trade Center and the Pentagon attacks on 9-11. Uh, I know I've heard people sell those for quite a price on eBay because they're, their use your uniqueness conspiracy nuts get very excited about those two cards and about a few others 
because just as you can read anything you want to into a tarot card, you can read a lot into the illustration for terrorists nuke and for the Pentagon card. You can also point out many, many ways in which those have nothing to do with the uh, with photographs of what actually happened, but that does not face the true believers at all. And and then from uh, that era, um, and you had like Pyramid Magazine, and there's some other ones that we probably don't have time to dive into, but you've done something like Toon uh, that uh, was done in 84 with Greg uh, Kostikian. And, uh, Greg Kostikian's game, yeah. Uh, we did Zombie Dice, which was a minor hit. Very simple little game. And uh, Killer, uh, which was perhaps the first recording of LARP rules. I think it may have been the first codification of a LARP game. And we don't recommend people play Killer anymore. It's too dangerous. Oh, really? Oh. The danger doesn't come from the other players, but uh, from the SWAT team that will come shoot you. So yeah, mistaken identity of uh, difference between playing and uh, real life. Right. Yeah. Skulking um, around at night with a water gun is just not smart anymore. Don't do it. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, and, but going back to what we were talking about with Munchkin, I the tell us the start and the maybe the surprise of the success of Munchkin. Oh, yeah. Munchkin was not the result of a long-term plan to dominate the market in silly games. Munchkin, Munchkin was a whim. I wanted to do a card game that mocked bad role-playing games. And you would go smashing around and kill things and take their stuff and level up and argue with the other players and never role play even one little bit. And most of the initial cards were hand drawn on the back of Illuminati cards, in fact, uh, blank Illuminati cards, uh, while Monica Stevens and I were on our way to a convention and we got enough written up to play test it at the convention and people just wouldn't stop playing. We said, okay, we have something here. The first print run was 5,000 and Monica said, you're not printing enough. And she was right. Those sold out immediately. So the next print run was 10,000 and Monica said, you're still not printing enough. And she was right. They sold out just as fast as the first one had. So then we started doing big print runs. And, uh, you know, as far as the surprise and success of it, like, and the, the perhaps maybe it's a nice introductory game uh, for young, younger kids and that kind of thing. Do you see uh, people going from Munchkin into some of your other products? And like, is that a, like a gateway for them moving into other games that you sell that are probably maybe more advanced? Well, I hope so, because we do put ads for some of the other games on the Munchkin box, but I honestly don't know. Okay. Uh, and after Munchkin and the wild success of that, I have to say that you perhaps are among the most patient men I know, because you waited 35 years after metagaming uh, quit working on the fantasy trip in order to reclaim it. Uh, it was that your intention all along and you were just like quietly waiting to see when you could uh, take back the rights to it? No, that would be a good story, but that's not the case. Uh, what happened is that long after I had written off ever being able to get TFT back, uh, the copyright laws were changed. And under the new laws, under certain circumstances, if you could prove that you had created a work and sold the rights to someone else, you could recover them after a long period of time. This was originally done to address uh, 
inequities in, for instance, the comic strip business where the creator of a superhero gets peanuts while millions and millions of dollars are being made off their work. And, and then once you got the copyright back and you took the, the rights to it back, you really went full in on the fantasy trip as far as like you did a Kickstarter, or I don't even know if it was a Kickstarter, but you refurbished yes. the entire line. And was that kind of like, uh, did that put a spring in your step as far as like, wow, I'm back at my roots? Just a little bit, yes. And where the success of it now, you've got uh, Hexagram, which we, you mentioned, number 10. I think it's, unfortunately, it's ending as we're speaking, maybe today or tomorrow. So probably not in time. Oh, it runs till it runs till four o'clock, but this podcast won't be up by then. That's okay. There'll be another one along. So that was number ten. So you've done one through nine already, um, and I'm sure number eleven will be on the way. You've also got 3D uh, printing miniatures for the fantasy trip. And yes, we so are. We're doing miniatures. Uh, we're probably you know, here's a marketing note for you. We're probably going to stop marketing those specifically as part of TFT because if that's the first thing that a miniature fan sees, that fan may think, oh yeah, these are just for that other game. And that's not the case. Were you ever were you into miniatures or is this kind of just you're following where the market is going? I have always loved miniatures. I still have some really badly painted minis from back when we were playtesting Fantasy Trip the first time. Yeah, I often say I I like the idea of miniatures, but when I was younger, I would have those lead miniatures and I would paint them and they would look like the Joker because like, you know, my hand was not that steady and the brushes were not that good. Paints have gotten better, figures have gotten better, even brushes. I won't say they've gotten better, but the really good ones are now affordable to a hobbyist. So if you like the idea, you might dip a foot back in the water and see what you can do. I, my collection of books uh, takes all my energy. <laughs> That's when uh, I started okay. into miniatures, I'd probably uh, have a divorce on my hand. So, uh, oh, don't do that. Nobody wants that. Um, as far as the industry goes and where you see it going. And I know we've had uh, Phil Reed, um, your CEO on the uh, show before as a guest, and I'll put a link to it up above. But I guess the question is like, you know, now that you're, you've got this long career that you've had, how much do you like to be hands-on? How much do you like to take a step back? Where, where do you see your future and the future of Steve Jackson games going? I want to be hands-on in everything all the time. I am a real pain in the butt uh, because every part of the process interests me. Some interest me more than others, so I don't go into the warehouse and interfere with the shipping very often. Uh, and they do a great job anyway. They don't need me. But I like making games. I like playing games, but I like making them. And I want to continue that as long as I can. I mean, I'm not even 70 yet. I've got a little run left. And as we close out here, I just have to ask you, you know, as I mentioned, many people have said what an inspiration either your games or yourself have provided them over the years. And uh, what advice, we talked about a little bit about the Kickstarter part of it, but if you were a young Steve Jackson in today's world, what would you do to get started into game design? I'm not sure. The market is so different. And the way I exist in the market now is different from the way I would exist if I were just getting started. I'd certainly use Kickstarter. I would pay more attention to art than I did when I was coming into the hobby. Uh, as uh, my, my first mentor was Howard Thompson at Metagaming and art was not, uh, not in the middle of his bullseye. So you always, I mean, you learn from the people you learn from. 
but I've learned over the years that art is more important. I would play test, play test, play test, and I would try to spend more time in the retail stores seeing what other people were playing and how it worked. Have you uh... game conventions are a very good way to get a whole lot of solid play experience. We didn't have those when I was coming up, and they're awesome. How many conventions do you get to a year? I mean, pre-COVID and now post-COVID? Oh, pre-COVID uh, was more than one a month. Now, a few a year. And do you uh, still enjoy kind of meeting the fans? And uh, I'm sure every one of them, once they kind of go, oh, there's Steve Jackson. There's Steve Jackson. There's Steve Jackson. And everybody gets excited. There's Steve Jackson. Yeah. Uh, it, yes, I enjoy meeting the fans. It's a great creative boost. And um, from here on in, we've got uh, your uh, more hexagrams coming, uh, more 3D miniatures coming, uh, zombie dice, more munchkin versions. Any other secrets that you can drop and go, hey, this is like a nice little project we're working on? Let's see. Okay, this is not a secret, but it's a new thing and it's pretty good. We got the licensing rights to do a Batman version of Munchkin that's just hitting the stores and it's a good one. You don't play Batman, you play the supervillains and you're all competing to commit crimes, which take the place of monsters. It, the game the game mechanics are really exactly the same. It's just a different skin. And, and we have Pathfinder Revolution, which will be coming to Kickstarter pretty soon. That's more like a Euro than anything else. It's an, an area control game, but you control your areas by bidding against the other players. So it really helps to be able to read minds in that game. Cool. Well, uh, I just want to say, you know, uh, thank you very much uh, for joining me today. I know I'm going to put links to Warehouse 23, uh, the Fantasy Trip, your Kickstarter. All those links are going to be in the show notes and the descriptions. Um, but I just want to say, you know, thank you for joining uh, me today and uh, sharing a little bit of your wisdom as well as uh, you know, future plans, because I'm sure there's a lot more in the tank and I'm excited to see what comes. We'll do our best.